Welcome to our panel on how strategic infrastructure investments can promote growth and investment. My name is Murat Sanmez. I'm a member of the Managing Board of the World Economic Forum, and it's my privilege to be uh, on the stage with our distinguished panelists. Uh, Gordon Brown, who's the chair of the World Economic Forum Global Strategic Infrastructure Initiative, uh, United Nations Special Envoy for Global Education, and Prime Minister of the United Kingdom from 2007 and 2010. And I had to stay here, he, stop here, he has done a lot uh, more, but this is a summary of uh, uh, the recent uh, roles Gordon has taken on. Majid Jafar, Chief Executive Officer of Crescent Petroleum, United Arab Emirates. Dr. Hani Milky, Chief Commissioner uh, of the Aqaba Special Economic Zone Authority. He's been very active uh, with the Jordanian government, including uh, being the f f Foreign Minister of Jordan. John Rice, Vice Chairman of GE, and Thierry Dao, Chief Executive Officer of Meridian Infrastructure. So welcome uh, to our panel, and thank you for being here. So I'd like to set the stage on uh, the case for infrastructure investments. It represents a big opportunity for economic growth, tackle the unemployment issue, yet serious challenges and obstacles remain from financing to political and regulatory risks and transparency. So I'd like to start with you, uh, Gordon Brown, if uh, we may. We just uh, wrapped up the Regional Business Council meeting, which uh, may have reminded you of the House of Commons setting when you walked in. It was a bit more civilized, I think, from what we saw on TV debates. Can you set the global context for infrastructure investments? And the oil price is at $60. And you said there has never been a better time. First of all, can I say what a, what a pleasure it is to be in Jordan and to see the progress that has been made in infrastructure, particularly by the King's announcements at the forum uh, yesterday, and to be speaking uh, to this uh, business uh, community because I want to acknowledge as someone who has uh, been involved in the region for many years, the crucial role of business, not simply in bringing prosperity to this region, but in advancing the cause of peace. And I want to thank you all for what uh, uh, you, you do. Now, you may wonder why it's a politician uh, uh, on this uh, stage uh, talking uh, as the first speaker on in infrastructure. Uh, I suppose I'm a recovering politician. Uh, I, um, it's said of uh, politicians that they promise to build bridges even when there is no water to cross. Uh, and you know that many plans exist in the minds of politicians that don't come to fruition because they're not thought through uh, because there is no proper planning uh, uh, to them and because the capacity is not there to implement. The reason I say that this is a huge opportunity now for infrastructure in this region is not just the need, high levels of youth unemployment, high uh, degree of need for particular facilities, whether it's water, power, uh, schools and, and hospitals, is, is because interest rates have been low, there is a surplus of savings, and even when we have the, the barriers to infrastructure finance, which is public finances are in a difficult position in many uh, countries, uh, the oil price is, uh, is low, uh, the banks have been put in a more difficult position to be lenders because of Baal III, uh, I do believe that the need and the low interest rate and the surplus of savings makes it possible for us to make huge progress in infrastructure. So what are the barriers? The barriers are in not recognizing that the most um, positive way forward is more effective partnerships between the public and private sector. And the World Economic Forum is uniquely positioned to try to bring people together, public and private sectors, to identify the possibilities, to look at the obstacles, and to see if we can provide solutions. The reason I'm speaking today is I'm chairing the initiative which is looking worldwide at what we can do to move these things forward. First of all, there is a large number of project preparation facilities, uh, and we must make it possible for the early stages of infrastructure projects to be properly financed when the risk is greatest uh, and when the returns are lowest. Secondly, there are huge advances now in looking at how we can support credit facilities that will mitigate the risk for business investors in infrastructure. Uh, and there are new plans that have come out of Davos and are coming forward in a number of just regional initiatives that mitigate uh, risks, whether they're construction risks, currency risks, political risks, regulatory risks, and looking scientifically at how we can do this. And the third thing is 
there are first loss and second loss facilities being examined and the EBRD and Thomas Meyer is here today are putting forward a proposal to the whole international community that we do something uh, to mitigate risk in this particular uh, uh, sense. So there is huge amount of new thinking in this area. There is no region with only 5% of your GDP spent on infrastructure that is more uh, uh, relevant to the development of uh, these ideas than this one. And I believe that we can make progress only by the public and private sector developing the capacity together uh, to move the need for infrastructure forward. That's power, that's energy, that's transport, road and rail, that's schools and hospitals, and that is the basis on creating a more uh, civilized, uh, more productive, uh, more fair uh, society, and one where we can advance the cause not just of prosperity, uh, but of peace and stability. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. You mentioned 5%, and if I'm not mistaken, China spends 15% of right. their GDP on infrastructure. So there's a lot of uh, room for uh, growth in this area. I'd like to turn to you, Hani Milky. You've been very active both on the technical and political sides of uh, infrastructure uh, investment. Um, can you talk about the regional context and how, what we can do to reduce the political risks and increase transparency? Well, thank you very much, Murad. Actually, uh, if we are looking for strategic infrastructure uh, projects, one has to look at projects in the region that transcend beyond local boundaries of countries, uh, such as uh, water pipelines, oil pipelines, gas pipelines, national grids, and regional grids, electricity grids, new renewable uh, power generation plants. All this will create number one, an interdependent region. That should reduce risk starting. Number two, it would provide uh, a place where disparities in income are minimized. Number three, it would uh, combat uh, terrorism, extremism, and at the same time would provide for transparency. Now, why isn't this happening? We feel, I feel that the major problem is the uh, private sector is shying away from coming into major long-term infrastructural projects. The reason is the political risk, regulatory risks, and the, the absence of transparency. If one looks at how can we get over these, if we know that the only investor today in the region or the main investor in the region is the public sector. And that's how much he can do. And that's how much cooperation he can provide. So one, the public sector cannot do it alone. The private sector is shying away because it's long term and the risk goes higher and exponential. So, and the banks, if we look at Basel III, the banks are limiting long term loans. We think, first of all, we have to address uh, investment uh, institutions, such as insurance companies, uh, funds, uh, sovereign wealth funds, and address and ask them to come and partner with the public sector on these projects. But that's not alone. That could provide transparency, but I don't think it will provide risk guarantees. In order for us to provide risk guarantees, I think we have to go to international financial institutions and have them, the three together, work together. One is providing the uh, governance of the projects and the programs. One is managing the programs, and one is providing the financial support that is needed. Uh, having said that, we're not saying that just because we think it's right. I think in Aqaba we did that. We have established a company for uh, development. And that company started making partnerships with the private sector in terms of implementation and managing, and with the international financial organizations and institutes in financing. We have completed some of the major harbors we are uh, witnessing in the next, we are going to witness in the next two days an example of that with a renewable energy project photovoltaic of 10 megawatt where that uh, trilateral or tri-party 
uh, participation is there. Uh, we are uh, looking for a railway to be uh, financed and operated in the same manner I mentioned. I think this is the way that we can create in Aqaba projects that are viable, transparent and risk-free, and in the region by having this interdependent, we can re reduce almost all the risks that are available, uh, uh, that are there for long-term investments that infrastructure requires. Uh, thank you, Hani. In our regional business council meeting, our chair, Omar al Ghanim uh, mentioned that uh, it takes a container nine days to go from Kuwait to Qatar. And it takes one day from Frankfurt to Nice, which is the same distance, because of different regulatory frameworks that at the cross, uh, crossing uh, points, the container has to be stopped. And if we can create this uh, within the region common framework, it not only um, reduces the risks and creates interdependency, but it also facilitates, uh, increases the productivity of uh, doing business. Majid, if we can um, pivot to you. If you, you've been very active in this field, uh, both uh, locally and also regionally, and uh, you proposed a Marshall Plan, and you have been the architect of the Arab uh, Stabilization Plan. If you can uh, give us your perspective from the regional uh, viewpoint, please. Sure, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, from a business perspective, uh, as the Crescent Group, we're a family business group, 45 years old now, headquartered in the UAE, uh, focused on the infrastructure space uh, in countries like Iraq and Egypt as well. In each of those countries over the last seven years, we've invested over $2 billion in the infrastructure space from the extractive industries, um, processing, pipelines, uh, power station construction into port management uh, and logistics. Um, looking at our region overall, what are the, what are the, first of all, I think we need to ask ourselves why this is important. And uh, we heard the deficit, and we were spending 5% of GDP compared to 15% uh, in China and about 10% on average in most of the rest of the world, in the developing world certainly. And why is that important? That's important because, in my view, that's why uh, China hasn't had another Tiananmen Square. And that's why we're going to keep having Tahrir squares. Uh, and the youth unemployment challenge, which is the number one risk as defined for our region, is caused partly by rigid labor markets and uh, education systems that are out of date, which have been well uh, addressed in other sessions at the summit. But first and foremost, caused by inadequate growth and in inadequate investment. Uh, and traditionally, the economic models in countries, many countries in this region, have been socialist, uh, state-centric models. And government expenditure has been completely eaten up, historically, in countries like Egypt, on recurrent expenditure. Uh, salaries, public sector salaries, subsidies, energy subsidies alone, uh, eat up two to three hundred billion dollars a year in this region, more than half the energy subsidies in the world, which is really a lost opportunity. Uh, and debt servicing leaving very little left for investment. And as was mentioned, the government has been relied upon traditionally as the main source of investment. And that's starting to change now. And Jordan has led the way with public-private partnership legislation and implementation capacity in the government. Uh, but it's the exception that proves the rule. Uh, and we need to really expand that know-how uh, across the region. We need to talk about, apart from the economic model, we can't ignore the politics. Uh, conflicts rage in the region. An international trust, trust between governments in the region, I would say, is at the lowest level uh, ever. Uh, and that is uh, an obstacle to uh, cross-border uh, investments and the type of multilateral uh, cooperation that, we, uh, that we, we talked about and that we said we need. And we can't ignore that fact. The other challenges that we have in the region, the oil sector is distortive because it's a huge part of GDP and income, but it's a very low part of uh, employment generation. Uh, and we have a concentration of capital. So there's a lot of capital uh, in the governments in the GCC states, but they're a minority of the population. Uh, and and uh, the major infrastructure investment requirements 
or the deficit in infrastructure spending is in other countries uh, in the region. So how to unlock that and get it redirected uh, to where it's needed. Uh, and the third challenge, of course, is the know-how. We don't have in the region, uh, by and large, that, that level of know-how. It is available in West and Western institutions, but marrying the know-how from uh, the international community to the capital in the West is, I think, the challenge. Uh, and, the, and, and the reasons that's become difficult, one is conflict, of course. Uh, you know, unfortunately, our region dominates for headlines of uh, conflict and instability rather than investment opportunity. And the second is the sense that it's not a poor region. Um, it actually is a poor region in most of, most of the region, but the sense is there is capital in the region, so why should the rest of the world uh, step up to help? So finding a way around that, creating the right structures that are going to unlock the capital within the region, and not just in governments. I think there's at least another $4 trillion in the private sector across the region. But capital is a coward, as uh, Mr. Hani said, when you've got uh, not just the conflict, uh, but regulatory obstacles. Uh, it needs to be married somehow with uh, the government funds uh, and multilateral structures that will give confidence and unlock the capital. Thank you. And uh, the issue of trust also came up in the uh, Regional Business Council meeting. And uh, one of the ministers highlighted the fact that as the uh, private par uh, public partnerships are being launched, the people are asking, questioning, why are the government selling the national assets? So establishing that trust is uh, absolutely key. Thierry Dow, Chief Executive Officer of Meridian Infrastructure, you have been uh, practicing this on a daily basis. Uh, you are at home everywhere around the world, is uh, when one of the uh, ministers, uh, Koro Diaz. How do you structure the deals? What is the secret for success? What is the secret source? I'll try to say that in less than three minutes, because <laughs> I could talk about it for about a whole day, but uh, I guess you will lose interest. But I, I would think of three pillars that are success factors of uh, PPP and infrastructure investment in general. Uh, the first one being strategic leadership and project preparation coming from the public sector, and I can give you a few examples of, of good practice in that. The, the second one is a resilient administration that is capable of engaging over the long term with the private sector and discuss issues from environment, job creation, training, uh, around infrastructure investment, which is quite a key component of infrastructure successful and sustainable investment. And, and the last one, uh, I would say, is the ability to create a project-specific environment to foster long-term lending uh, for the specific project, long-term lending and long-term investment. Uh, on, on the first example, I'd like to take two uh, very different um, example of countries. If, I, if I, I like to name Canada, for example, for being one of the leading country with providing real skills, talent, and resources for project preparation with the PPP Canada that has a budget of about a billion Canadian dollars a year. Uh, that's probably the Rolls Royce of uh, all we would want to see everywhere. Um, but an, another more modest but very efficient example is the South African government that has been able, with very little capital, to put together a PPP unit to deal with its renewable energy program and has been one of the most successful in the past few years uh, country in terms of delivering renewable energy for, for the country. So with very little, you could do a lot. With a lot of money, you can do also a lot. But uh, uh, clearly, strategic guidance, project preparation is key to attract uh, and, and, and to create success. The, the second um, point about the administration resilience, and I don't want to, to go too far into political risk. At the end of the day, uh, rating is one view of the risk in a country. What is important for investors and what makes projects successful is the ability of an administration to engage and discuss issues with investors in the private sector on all level. Uh, I mean, job creation is one of the key factor, and for that I'll take the example of what we've achieved in Turkey on their social program. They did have 
the focus and the strategy to want to develop a network of public hospitals. But we've also had the ability to engage closely with the Ministry of Health on issues like the environment when creating the first hospital in Adana next to the Syrian border, but also thinking how we could deal with the local companies, job creation, training, and even how health services would be developed around uh, this hospital. So these are good examples. Uh, the, that same example can serve in terms of showing how you can mobilize long-term capital if you have the proper framework and, and, and specific project framework. I mean, this project was possible very much because we teamed up with a number of multilateral agencies, EBRD being one, but IFC, but also MIGA being present and allowing uh, a country like Turkey to really access 18-year long-term capital, plus our capital, which is 25 years longer. And, and that support and those guarantees and that partnership was essential uh, in, in really bringing that long-term capital, allowing people to really come develop the project and, and stay for the long term. Thank you, fascinating stories. And um, again, this uh, government resilience was brought up in the RBC session. And I think uh, in 2011, the natural gas supply to Jordan from Egypt uh, was cut off, basically, because of the uh, political developments. Uh, but the country used the public-private partnership model and really recovered very quickly in a matter of a couple of years and now has more uh, surplus and more reserves. Uh, so your point about government resilience and framework is absolutely uh, on the spot. John, if we can uh, switch to you, as uh, GE have been underground in the region for 80 years, if you can share some of your experiences uh, from the past, your plans, and also what can governments do to uh, guarantee success or maximize the chances? Sure. Thanks, Murat. It's, uh, it's great to be with you and to talk about this subject because it is, I think, so important in this world and we see examples of it everywhere we do business, which is about 170 countries. But this is our, our largest, fastest growing growth region and we measure that a lot of different ways. So what happens here really matters to us. But, but a comment about the context, because we've been talking for the last couple of days about the implications of oil at $60 a barrel and the need for extra funding for security related <clears throat> activities, all of which puts a tremendous amount of stress on the fiscal side of the equation. And as Gordon pointed out, there's already a shortfall in infrastructure investment. The current environment's only going to make it more difficult. Globally, it's about a trillion dollars of shortfall every year. So. So this point about how we facilitate financing and capital flows to get to infrastructure projects has never been more important or more pressing. Demand for infrastructure is great and the need for speed and accountability that governments are held to everywhere in the world. If, if they don't deliver, there are repercussions. People just aren't patient, they're not waiting. The demands are significant. So I have, I have two, two thoughts about this that I'd like to share with the group. One is, is around how we define infrastructure. It is a, a broad term that covers a lot of things, but when you think about the development of an economy and delivering results for a population, you, you really have to start with some very basic things like electricity, like clean water, like health care. So, one thought is to think about infrastructure in the context of Maslow's hierarchy of needs where, where we and public institutions and the global funding institutions maybe do different things for the, for the infrastructure requirements that are at the bottom of the triangle. Because if you don't have electricity or good health care or clean water, you, can't, you don't really care about anything else. So maybe the IMF and the World Bank could relax some of their requirements for good infrastructure projects that are focused at the bottom of the, of the triangle. And the second point I'd make quickly is, is the need for clarity around what the government priorities are. Where we've seen that in this region, Saudi Arabia a few years ago, Vision 2020, a clear call for companies like ours <clears throat> to help diversify the economy 
resulted in a series of investments that we committed to and some, some work on the ground that is a contribution toward those objectives, but a clear agenda, clear priority, not unlike the five-year plan that China is quite famous for. If you understand that five-year plan and you line up underneath it, you, you contribute. And, and I think the, you know, we're operating in Egypt now on, a, on an emergency power project. The order was committed in December of last year. The units are coming online now. We've never done anything that fast. And it's because the single-minded focus of the president, the ability of, to get all of the ministries working together, that has allowed a level of speed in execution which, which we haven't seen. And I suspect the Egyptians haven't seen. It's a role model for the rest of the world, especially given the regional context. That's uh, quite impressive. Before we turn to the audience for q and I'd like to ask uh, Hani one question. The, uh, at oil prices around $60, the issue of subsidies come up. And uh, it's an opportunity for all importing countries because it reduces the cost, but for exporting countries, uh, who it's a matter of financial gap. And it's uh, easy to say we can reduce the subsidies, but it has a lot of social implications. And going back to basic uh, Maslow hierarchy of needs, how do we tackle this uh, dilemma of we know what needs to be done, but how do we do it in such a way that that does not create further social um, unrest? Any thoughts on that? Well, actually, uh, removing subsidy makes the, the, and makes the product available for everybody because mm. with a subsidy, what happens is you abuse the product, whatever it is, and that would create more costs on the public sector in terms of providing new infrastructure. That would put more taxes. So are we looking at front-loading or back-loading? If you are having subsidy, that's what, what you're doing is front-loading. You're asking, you're giving the money to the people and you are allowing them to abuse that product. And at the end of the day, the society becomes poorer and poorer. Or if we backload and then we, we, we sell the product at its price, we're creating a consumer that uh, would like not to abuse the product. He would save on the product. And at the end of the day, he will pay less taxes. So the issue is, is the society willing to uh, wait and gain the profits of development or not. This is something that has to come through education, through training, through being transparent in your programs and projects and showing that this will work. But if you remove subsidy and at the end of the day, two years later, you increase taxes, then nobody is going to trust you after that. So I think you have to, uh, if you're going to subsidize, you subsidize in terms of improving productivity rather than reducing productivity. Okay, thank you. So again, goes back to Majid's point of uh, trust and raising the awareness and preparing the public uh, for something that may hurt them. Uh, I, I just wanted Here. to add a point on the subsidies. I mean, if you take the solar industry, for example, I mean, subsidy has been something really spoiling it. Since a number of countries have abandoned subsidies, uh, technology has actually improved to make this technology a competitive source of energy, uh, which hasn't been the case in Europe, for example, for a long time because of the subsidies. Uh, but when you look at a number of countries in Africa, and I think it is possible also here, you can actually <coughs> produce energy at competitive level. So oil price going down may be also an opportunity with that subsidy issue to create more innovation about how we make it and how competitive we need to be. So it, uh, just to John's point on definition, and I think it is important, I mean, what do we mean by, by infrastructure? So the World Bank in 2013 had, a world, had an infrastructure report and, and went deep dive on this region. And it estimated the deficit in spending is about $100 billion a year, approximately half in new investment, and the other half maintenance of existing infrastructure, which sometimes gets forgotten. And 80% of that requirement was really power, uh, you know, John's own sector, sector and transportation you know, the, the sort of 
middle income, uh, you know, uh, on the way up in the hierarchy of needs. And in terms of impact, so most of that spending, the current spending, is going on in the, in the GCC. But actually, it, if, if you look at the three types of countries in the region and impact, uh, it estimated every billion dollars uh, could create uh, work for 26,000 people in the GCC, uh, mixed between short and longer term uh, jobs. But in the oil developing countries like Iraq, uh, it's, the figure is um, 49,000 jobs. In oil importing countries like Egypt and Jordan, uh, that billion dollars could create 110,000 uh, jobs. So it's different uh, level of impact across the region. So wh what is the motivation? Well, one, it has to be stability. I mean, the Gulf states and, and, and the, the international community want to see stability in the region. It's a key theme of this summit, tackling extremism and its causes. Uh, and the other one is returns. I mean, interest rates, rates are pitifully low today. Asset classes, most are not as attractive as they were. And the World Bank report estimates that infrastructure investment across the world gives you returns of between 5 and 25 percent, um, all of which are better than most alternatives that are facing governments uh, today. I, I think we're now getting a picture of the gains that could come to this region by focusing on infrastructure. The gap, as has just been said by Majid, $100 uh, billion a year. Energy subsidies, roughly two to three hundred billion dollars a year. So, if you could divert some money at a time when oil costs are low from energy subsidies into infrastructure, you could make a huge difference to the quality of life in the region. But of course, also, you've just been given figures about the employment impact of a hundred billions of investment leading to tens of millions of jobs. And so, not only do we have this need, uh, but we have. Uh, means by which we can deal with this need. But the important point I would want to emphasize before we go out to the uh, group, the, 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 the questions from the floor, is, is that how much more can be achieved if you can have effective public-private partnerships? The public money which is under pressure could go further, private savings can be brought in, returns can be high. So it is potentially a win-win uh, situation for private investors, for the public sector, uh, but also for meeting the needs of the large number of young people in this region who are looking for opportunities for employment. And that's why I think this focus on infrastructure today is incredibly important for the long-term future of the region. Thank you, Gordon. With that, I'd like to turn to the audience for uh, questions. If you can raise your hands, we'll get you a mic. And if you can mention your name, your affiliation, and a short question. And if it is directed to any of the panel members, please uh, specify that. Why don't we start in the first row on the left here? Yeah, my name is Duraid Mahasne from APC, and my question actually remark uh, to Mr. Jafar. I, I fully agree with him. If we don't reach political reform in this region, and particularly, in particular, put the religion and the disputes in religion aside, we would continue to kill each other. We, we do not realize that we are not throwing flowers on Daesh or on, in Yemen or in Libya. That is costly wars. And costly wars means less expenses and less money or less funds to do anything in infrastructure. Gradually, if that is not sustained, we wouldn't have uh, any economical growth. Thank you. Thank you. Question close to you. Now we'll go to the lady behind you. Loyal Khatib from Iraq Energy Institute. Uh, <coughs> Iraq is supposed to increase, double its oil production by 2022, at least um, 7.5 million barrels, quadruple its production on the gas um, and utilize and monetize it, plus doubling the power uh, electricity basically to at least 24 gigawatt. Now all this development requires significant investment in infrastructure, the very bottleneck that delaying achieving these targets. Uh, in addition to this, we have the challenge of attracting foreign direct investment. That's at least 1.2 trillion US dollars. Under current oil prices, um, low oil prices and um, the war on terrorism, what would be your recommendation to uh, realize these um, um, targets um, by 2020 or beyond? Thanks. John, do you want to take this on? And then we'll go sure. to other panel members. I, I, well, there's two areas that I would concentrate on, among others. Um, 
One is uh, willingness to, to, to give sovereign guarantees. Uh, you know, without those, I don't see the foreign capital being, being available to fund anything close to what's required, and I think you summarized it, it very accurately. The other thing, notwithstanding the challenges that exist in Iraq today, is some way for the government to come together so that there is a cohesive voice about what, what the priorities are. It's, it's a complicated place to do business, and we're, we're very active there. We have several hundred employees. We've been, we've been in Iraq. We've gone the distance in Iraq, and we're not going anywhere. But there's a lot of friction in the government processes, getting approvals, getting permits. And I, I know that doesn't sound like a grandiose solution, but it's critically important when you're trying to move an infrastructure project forward. And if you're an investor and you have choices, and most of the investors we're talking about do, you're just going to go someplace else where it's easier. So there has to be a real effort to simplify and modernize the way the government bureaucracy works. Thank you. Terry, do you want to comment on the question? Um, no, no, I'm no? Fine. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, lady behind you. Um. Uh, I'm Reem, a uh, global shaper. Um, you know, infrastructure development investment in, in the region, and particularly in poor and fragile countries, are usually reliant on grant schemes or loans from the World Bank and, and such organizations. Um, sometimes indirectly or directly, uh, you know, the, this support is associated with political agendas. Mm. Right now we're seeing uh, new players coming on board, like China's uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment um, Bank. Um, we see some countries in the region joining this bank. So how would this impact the region, and what would the role of Western countries be like in the short to, me, to long term? Majid? That's an excellent point. It was actually uh, the next one I was going to make, so you made it for me. <laughs> so I think we do need to look at some of what's really going on in the ground. First of all, new institutions like the one you just mentioned, $50 billion committed. Many Western countries actually joining, including the UK and Germany and Italy. It was the US which criticized it. And actually, uh, the US government got a lot of criticism from former US ministers and academics for criticizing it. Um, because, uh, and it looks so far like they're, they're going for a world standard. I mean, there was some criticism of China's investments in Africa on human rights, on, on using Chinese companies and Chinese labor. But for this body so far, what I've been hearing, they're getting, they're actually poaching people from the World Bank, the legal advisor, the human rights advisor, people from the US Foreign Service. They're trying to create a world institution. And governments in the region, including UAE, Qatar, Oman, and others have joined. And they're now talking to Egypt and others uh, in the region. So I think we do need to look at different institutions, whether there have been those who have called for one from the Arab world, now, our track record in the Arab world of inter-Arab institutions is not great. I don't think we have time to, to build another one. But maybe we can create an Arab fund and, and, and you know, partner with the AIIB uh, or others like the EBRD um, to have that impact. And the other thing I would say is different local funding models. So just give one example, the uh, Egyptian Second Suez Canal. Uh, despite the conflict, despite you know the, all the uh, political transitions, they raised eight billion dollars in three days, uh, and it was more than half of it was like crowdfunding from Egyptians, uh, which shows you actually how much money there is not just in private uh, companies but under people's mattresses uh, in the region if the right projects can be uh, uh, identified. So we don't just need to look at external uh, money or government money. There, there are uh, you know, innovative approaches now uh, that can work in our region itself. I mean, uh, Gordon Brown? Yeah, I, I don't think there's any substitute for governments in the region having their own plans that are carefully thought out, developing the capacity within the government to deliver public-private uh, partnerships, and leadership uh, from the top uh, the, the, the leading uh, uh, people in the country uh, pushing the infrastructure projects. And without these, uh, things are not going to happen. But what's been said is absolutely right. 
there is a, an availability of uh, finance uh, around the world uh, from some of the new initiatives. There's going to be a BRIC bank soon. Uh, we've got the uh, World Bank developing a new infrastructure facility of its own. We've got the regional development banks, the EBRD in the region with uh, uh, resources to put into this. And we've got the new Asian investment facility, which is a lending facility. It's not a it's not an equity uh, taker, it's a lending facility, but that's very substantial funds that are going to be available. Uh, in the end, too, however, uh, the sovereign guarantees are probably more important than the money that is provided by these public agencies. And I think it's important to recognize that the balance of uh, activity between public and private sector is going to change. Public sector guarantees may be more important than public sector money in the longer run. Uh, and we've got to look at how we can mitigate the risks in such a way that these guarantees can be given. The EBRD is, of course, very active in the region, and maybe uh, Thomas Meyer might want to say something about his proposal for a first and second risk facility that would make uh, private investment a far more attractive option uh, for companies that are considering it. Thomas. Um, thank, thank you very much. I, you know, before I turn to that, I think it's important uh, uh, for all of us to understand that, for example, AIIB, we see this as a, 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 a huge opportunity uh, for us because AIIB will be a risk-taking project finance bank and we need more of those <coughs> players. Um, secondly, I think uh, in the last few years, uh, the landscape of IFI cooperation has really changed and uh, we now work together uh, in, in a very regular and very effective way through GIF, uh, through the Global Infrastructure Hub uh, that will be established in Sydney uh, in, within the context of G20 and so on and so forth. And I think when we look at uh, uh, the, the IFI's role in promoting infrastructure, we need to ask ourselves what are the, uh, the enablers for private investment in public infrastructure? They are a, a, a government that has a long-term vision and the capacity uh, to deliver, which means know-how, vision, and stability. And we also do need to have together to create a credible pipeline of projects so that the private sector sees it as attractive to move into a market. And that's where IFIs work together. And uh, an additional element of where IFIs are increasingly active um, is to crowd in institutional investors, because I think bank funding um, is, is available for, for projects as, as soon as they are bankable. And we see this in Turkey, where now in the social hospital program, um, uh, 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 this $18 billion program is now largely funded by private banks. And uh, what we try to do with our proposal for a risk uh, mitigation facility is to crowd institutional investors into this space because we see that in countries where there is a credible pipeline and a, and a good delivery, like in Turkey and in Jordan here, we need institutional investors to come in. And that's, that's the additional role I think we as IFIs, whether it's the World Bank, uh, MIGA, IFC, uh, EIB and, and so on can play. And this is what we want to play. Thank you. I mean, Thank can, you, Tom. Can, can I add, uh, yes, sure. just to finish on what Thomas was saying, because we, we're currently trying to create the first project bond in Turkey to actually attract institutional investors. But what we shouldn't forget is that there's a lot of capital present in this region. It's probably one of the richest in capital. And this capital also needs to commit to its own region to give comfort to capital from outside, because it's very difficult for European investors to understand that they sit next to sovereign wealth funds from this region to buy utilities in the UK, in Germany, and that when they come over here, they don't really see those same people. So there's a bit of an appeal to be made to sovereign wealth funds and institutions in this region to actually commit to their own people. Thank you. Honey, a brief comment before we go on to the next yes, question. Uh, first of all, we have to say that we need the political will for the partnership before we can so talk about anything. We need to not only prioritize, but we do not wait to finish Daesh or other than Daesh. We have to go to work. Number three, yeah. when we talk about sovereign guarantees, how are we going to get sovereign guarantees from non-sovereign countries? We have to look at the regional uh, solution where it is cross-boundary guarantees because what is going to be good 
for the whole region is what happens in every individual country. So actually now today, if we are going to be locked in for governments that are participating in a regional plan for the region, locked into seeing how we can get money from banks when banks are not giving money. I agree, we have to go to investment institutions. We have to get the guarantees through international financial institutions. That's what sends the, 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 uh, the, sp the spirit of that we are going to rebuild this uh, region. Thank you, honey. We have a question in the front here, and then we'll go back. Hi, I'm Dr. Safa Nasruddin, former minister of ICT from Palestine. Um, infrastructure for development is essential, and we in Palestine have the plans as a government. We have the money from Peltel, the private sector, and we have the partnership. But we don't have access to technology and access to our spectrum, access to our frequency and 3G. We are maybe the last country that do not have the 3G frequency. Now people are speaking about 5G, not 3G. So how can the World Economic Forum and the international community here help us to have access to technology and access to our infrastructure in order to have development and economic prosperity? Thank you. Uh, very good question. In fact, during the Regional Business Council, we were given the mandate to look at the infrastructure issue and how public-private partnership can facilitate the investments in the areas where it's needed, which uh, under chairmanship of Gordon Brown will take it to our global uh, infrastructure initiative and definitely include this uh, uh, key challenge uh, in the perspective. And hopefully uh, by Davos and the next uh, meeting in Egypt in May, we will have made significant progress. Can we go back to uh, fourth row in the middle, please? There's a mic to your right. I think there's a mic. Hello, my name is Farid Yassin. I'm the Iraqi ambassador to France. And as such, I co-chair with uh, a colleague from OECD, uh, Olivier saint a uh, working group under the aegis of OECD to look at investment uh, security in the Middle East, particularly for infrastructure. Uh, one of the things that will be coming out of that uh, work is a, a handbook devoted to uh, PPP. Mm. Uh, and it'll be written in such a way to facilitate the understanding of this topic by decision makers. And to make it available to decision makers in the area, it's going to be translated into Arabic. Um, I've seen in my own country in Iraq that uh, a lot of people do not understand all the implications of, of PPP, in particular the need for a strong regulatory, regulatory environment. But one of the other things that is addressed by the task force is uh, um, the issue of how to bring uh, Islamic finance as a resource into infrastructure funding. And maybe this is a better venue to discuss this. So I'd like you to comment on that. Thank you. Thank you. Any panelists on Islamic I mean, uh, theory? Maybe we'll come to you. It, it is possible to bring Islamic finance, uh, but at the moment, I think it's been done essentially through the like of guarantees. I mean, the Islamic Development Bank, for example, has guaranteed one of the banks that was lending to the Turkish hospital program. But, but I do think that what is lacking is perhaps is a partnership with people like EBRD, people that could bring expertise to unlock the balance sheet that they have, because Islamic finance is actually quite abundant, uh, but, but often uh, what is lacking is the enabling facilitator to, to actually lend to those projects in a, in a big way, because I, I, would, I would really think that, that they can make a difference. I'm meeting the president of uh, IDB tomorrow in Saudi Arabia. I'll personally convey the message as well. On, on the first point that was being made there about um, a guide to how more effective public-private partnerships could be constructed, I think that's a, an excellent idea. And the World Economic Forum is working with the OECD also on this idea of a sustainable credit facility uh, whereby uh, USAID, the Swedish Development Corporation, a number of private sector banks are offering to provide credit for infrastructure in emerging market countries. So that's a cooperative uh, effort of the OECD and the World Economic Forum. Okay. Lady in the second row here, and then we'll come to. Okay. 
This is Asma, Global Shipper from Gaza Hub. Uh, so you have mentioned uh, the investment in infrastructure for development. It has been in the area for uh, like a while now. And unfortunately, the impact has been little uh, compared to the potentials in the area. And you've all mentioned that sustainability is very important and the stability of the region is very important as well. But unfortunately now, the situation is much worse in different areas and countries in, in the MENA region. So my question to you is, Although the situation is worse and we don't have the stability that you are seeking for investment, what can actually be done in order to tackle and to, and to have an impact? And do you think that the public-private partnership is the only solution for what is happening and how we can take the agendas, the plan, the communities and the committees that is being done into an actual, uh, an actions and steps that be can be implemented in the ground. And my last question is how we, you, we as young people can have a role in that instead of just receiving the jobs that is created by the investment in, our, in, uh, in infrastructure. Thank you. Majid? Yeah, so uh, I mean, excellent point. I mean, that's I think the key uh, message from this panel, uh, which Mr. Hani put eloquently, we can't wait uh, for the stability to make the investment. The investment is going to help lead to the stability. I mean, if you look at post-war Europe, the U.S. didn't do the Marshall Plan, didn't wait for you know, all the embers to die down until everything was, was stable in, in uh, Western Europe. They committed 5% of U.S. GDP, $12 billion at the time. In today's money it would be $600 billion uh, into Western Europe to stabilize. Uh, and it had a political objective. It wasn't because you know, to help Europeans per se, it was to stop the spread of communism and fight communism. And if we want to fight instability, extremism in our area, we need to look at it as a political uh, objective. I totally agree with you. Uh, while recognizing that it does need the two things which were highlighted, it needs vision at the national level and the international level. Uh, and it needs reducing risk because Private capital is a coward in a sense. I mean, it looks for stability uh, and return. So how can we reduce that risk? And the issue of guarantees um, at the, again, national level uh, and the multilateral uh, level. We have Ms. Honda here from, the, uh, uh, from MIGA. So there are some international uh, approaches to that as well. But we, we do need to uh, drive the agenda forward while dealing with the political and conflict issues. Because if we wait, you know, it's like, we, it's like a forest uh, on fire, and the fires are all over the forest in the Middle East. If we just keep going and trying to put out the forest fires without addressing the guy who's starting them all, uh, we're never going to succeed. Okay. Thank you. John, very quickly, and then I want to go back to the Just audience. to add an exclamation point to this. I mean, we're talking about long-term investments in a short-term world. And the only way you get over that is to have a clear agenda, a clear vision, a clear plan that, gover that can withstand the test of time as far as governments are concerned. And if you get that, you will attract investors. Without it, you're going to be, it's going to be this project and that project and miscellaneous stuff. And we'll be back next year and the year after and the year after talking about the same stuff. In, in, in practical terms. <laughs> if you want to build something in Gaza and you get a guarantee from MIGA together with a guarantee from Saudi Arabia, you will build anything you want. So it's, it's not that difficult. Okay, thank you. Um, first you. question. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Thank, thank you very, very, very much. Uh, I sit on an advisory board on uh, IDB, uh, Islamic Development Bank, and I know they're very active on infrastructure. Uh, since a very long time and raising an additional fund on that. And uh, hence, you know, I would recommend that anybody who is seeking Islamic product to go and approach them <laughs> at this moment. Uh, I come from Oman, from an Oman investment fund. I'm a chief executive. And I wanted to assure Terry that capital is available regionally to invest in infrastructure projects. The fact of the matter is that Oman has been at the forefront in terms of utility, uh, private, uh, public-private uh, initiatives, and we are seeking now to expand on those. So I would appreciate if the panel could comment on the Canadian infra project that Thierry have alluded to, 
and uh, what Jafar have alluded to as well in terms of the Jordanian legislative uh, act that have come uh, in this country. If Thank you, you could, I'd be appreciative. Sure. Thank you. Thierry and Dan. Uh, I mean, the example of, of Canada, and I do recognize Oman is probably a leader in investing in this particular region, but perhaps an exception. Uh, <laughs> the example in Canada is very simple. There's an enabling act at the federal level, but also at all the provinces, and they've basically concentrated in units, one federal and many regionals, uh, the capacity of the government to contract uh, infrastructure projects. And although it's called PPP Canada, those, these units is really focused on assessing every infrastructure project from a project preparation perspective, then decide whether it's going to be a PPP or not, if it's not, if it's the right thing, and then implementing it. So they have the full chain, the full delivery system in hand, and they have people that they employ somehow out of the government normal pay scale, or maybe they are in a sort of special scale. Uh, they're people that they come from the private sector, so they hire as a real agency real talent from all over and because they have a fairly strong budget to do that. And they keep them, they give them responsibility, and, and that's how it works. Thank you. Majid? I think the uh, Jordan legislation part, maybe Mr. Hani would address it better, or? Go ahead. The, the, the question was on, was on the, the, the see, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not from Jordan, I don't know the details, but what I do understand is uh, probably in the region, best in class in terms of government capacity, uh, for managing and implementing such investments uh, and, and legislation, not just the legislation but also uh, the entities in the government to manage it. I think Jordan has actually set the standard. Uh, the airport that you all arrived at uh, is an example of that, uh, which was a public-private partnership, uh, very successful uh, model. So I think that kind of learning can be uh, expanded uh, across the region. Honey? Yes. Well, uh, two points I'd like to, meet, uh, to make. One is in our uh, private-public uh, partnership law, which was passed uh, six months ago. It came as a natural uh, step two after the privatization process. Now, this uh, puts the, 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 the guidelines of how partnerships can work and what are the obligations of every party and how you can go and take loans. So this is the most important thing. And how can you guarantee sovereign loans and on what percentage based on uh, how much the investment is? But I also want to refer to the question from my colleague, the Minister of uh, Telecommunications of Palestine. Uh, when we talk about PPI, when we talk about private, public, international financial institution partnerships, we're not only talking about money. Please don't think that we're talking only about money. We're talking about technology. We're talking about transparency. We are talking about pro proper implementation and timely implementation of projects. So it's not only a partnership where somebody would give money and then share uh, the, 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 the paybacks. No, it's a, a complete partnership that takes all this into consideration when the partnership is casted. Thank you. Gordon, a quick remark, and then we'll take one last question from the audience. Yeah, I, I think that was a very important question about building up expertise within the public sector to be able to negotiate good public-private partnerships. And we actually set up a unit within uh, Britain in the uh, United Kingdom Treasury, and it was so successful, it itself became a public-private partnership. <laughs> and so there, there is a, a huge uh, history that we can draw on of cooperation uh, and building up expertise. I just want to come back to, very briefly to the question that was the, the brilliant question beforehand about what could be done uh, to increase the stability of the region through investment. Now, infrastructure may seem a boring word to young people in the region, but the real key to the future of the region and to employment prospects is building up the infrastructure in such a way that there's prosperity and through prosperity people can see the benefits of peace and, and stability. And what I wanted to emphasize was that if governments within this region and if the region as a whole uh, comes together to formulate uh, better plans for infrastructure, there is now no shortage of international support 
uh, to make these things uh, come alive. Obviously, the dynamism has got to come from within the region, but you have the new facility at the World Bank. You have a knowledge bank being created by the G20. You have a huge number of project preparation facilities, and you have now uh, first loss and second loss facilities being talked about that could be of great advantage to the countries in this region. So uh, to think ahead, no shortage of support available if the dynamism can come from within the region to move this forward. And it's a great job creator as well as a great uh, uh, bringer of prosperity in the long run. Thank you, Gordon. We'll take one last question from the middle, uh, gentlemen in the sixth row, and then we'll wrap it up in the last uh, one minute. If you can be quick, please, and All point right. your question to the panelists. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, very much for the discussion. My question is more about... If you can introduce yourself. Um, Mohammed Tamalia. I'm a global shaper from the Jeddah Hub. We spoke about subsidies, we spoke about privatization, we touched upon it. My question is more about privatization. I mean, subsidies, or if you want to look at the economics or the GDPs of any of the economies, uh, a lot of the burden, I mean, when it comes to uh, spending, for example, in Saudi Arabia for, on healthcare or so forth and education, it takes a bit of the burden on in spending on infrastructure and other areas. So what is your view on privatization of areas such as healthcare in Saudi Arabia? or in other regions in the GCC? And does the privatization help these governments in spending on other areas that are more probably pivotal in terms of infrastructure in those respective countries? Very good question, but unfortunately we ran out of time. Uh, so what I suggest we do is, I'm not avoiding the question. Uh, we'll be here, and I encourage you, you're part of the Global Shaper community. We are thrilled to have the uh, youth engaged uh, with the World Economic Forum in our initiatives, and uh, thank you for raising the questions. And this, is, uh, this panel discussion and interactive session shows us that investing in infrastructure is good for the region, it's good for the economy, it's good for the people, no matter what the political, social context is. And we have seen success stories, and I'm thrilled to see the will uh, from the panelists and the audience to get together in a public-private cooperation setting. And we, as the World Economic Forum, invite all of you to join our Global Strategic Infrastructure Initiative, which is tackling these issues under the leadership of Gordon Brown. So thank you very much for 